Hello again, art history students. Welcome to um, another lecture. So now we are in unit three and uh, we're talking about Rome today. But first we're gonna talk about Etruscan art, which is sort of like the pre-Romans. So Rome was initially a city-state of the Etruscan Empire. And this culture coincided with the Greeks. So did the Romans. The Romans kind of saw themselves as the inheritors of the artistic traditions of the Greeks. So there are gonna be a lot of things, a lot of that vocabulary from the Greek lecture is gonna come back up and kind of come back into play. So with that, we're gonna start off, there's only about three, maybe four Etruscan artworks that we're gonna look at. First is this um, sarcophagus. So this is terracotta. It is to hold the bodies of two people. So a lot of the themes that we talked about in uh, the last unit, in unit two, was about the afterlife. But I want you guys to kind of point out a couple things that probably look very, very similar, which is kind of the shape of the face and then also this kind of triangular body. We've seen that before with the Aegean cultures. And then also, we're just moving on to this slide, with the ancient Egyptian cultures. And then again, with this early Greek artwork, the um, this statue of the boy, right? And we talked about this when we, or we talked about it more in depth when we talked about the, um, difference between the archaic period and the classical period and kind of that comparison and contrasting. So we see that, excuse me, these two people do have a lot more kind of motion to their body. It's not super naturalized. No one kind of lays sideways like that. But they are much more naturally depicted and she would have held in her hand, she has her hands kind of in this little gesture like this. There would have been an egg probably made of um, silver, uh, potentially gold, depending, and that would have, the egg is very symbolic of the afterlife, right? We still kind of have that with like, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Kind of like, is this life, you know, this realm and the sacred realm and the difference between them. So that's one of the reasons why that's so symbolic. All right, another kind of vocabulary word that's gonna come up and had come up before is this idea of the frieze, which is basically this architectural section that usually depicts a narrative. And we saw these on the uh, Greek temples, right? We talked about that cornice and all that kind of stuff, just quick refresh. And then now we're gonna talk about an interior frieze, which is a decorative band, usually up towards the top of the room, but it can kind of encompass the whole room. There are gonna be two that we're gonna see in this lecture. This is the first one, which is from the Tomb of the Leopards. This will almost for sure be on the test. Just remember that it's Etruscan. It's part of a tomb. So this would have been um, a place where people would have their final resting moments. This kind of checker pattern that you see up here is resembling the tent that would go over the body or go over the whole funeral procession. And uh, we still have that today. If you go to a graveside service or something like that, there's usually a tent set up um, kind of over where, you know, the body's going to be lowered down and all that, all that kind of stuff. So this is, this is very much so something that we still have in our practices today, but that's what that checkerboard pattern is imitating is that specific tent that would go up. And then there are these beautiful, beautiful uh, leopards right here that are kind of growling at each other. And this, this whole thing that goes all the way around the interior of the room, we'll say, but it's, you know, the tomb, is this beautiful interior frieze, right? So we have twisted perspective in use, right? We're kind of seeing a lot of ancient Egyptian influence in the way that the bodies are depicted. They're kind of twisted for your viewing, whatever make, or the viewing way that is easiest for you to digest. Bleh. It didn't quite come out right. And again, this is also a fresco, which is a term that you should know. So there's a couple kind of 
uh, vocabulary words that are building on top of each other when we look at this artwork. So that might be an indicator beyond the test. All right, the next, not the final Etruscan artwork, but one that's really going to emphasize what's about to come is this work. We're gonna call it the orator, right? Um, I did a terrible job, I better line that. But when someone is orating, they're talking, right? I'm orating right now and you're watching it <clears throat> at what will be a later date. So this guy has a couple things going on. He's cast in bronze, which we talked about before during the Greek lecture, uh, that lost wax bronze casting, but he's not idealized. He's not a, he's not a deity. He's not, he's not in any way, shape or form have this pristine perfection to him or to his body, right? We see from his face, he has these kind of wrinkles and whatnot showing age, showing the, you know, the kind of jowl and whatnot. He has his hand outstretched in this posture, which is known as the speaking posture, right? Anytime a politician or anybody who's giving a speech, they'll kind of put their arm out like that. And that's like, hey, hey, I've got, you know, you need to listen to me kind of thing. So that's what this is about. This is kind of a political artwork. There's not a lot that's known about it, but I would make the argument that this is a leader of the community and he has been immortalized as the speaker. Well, what he's speaking about and whatnot, we don't know. And part of the reason is there's this text on here, which is part of the Etruscan language, which they call a dead language. So this is just kind of like Jeopardy facts for you guys to know. Whenever a language has a root language, right? Like English has um, Latin roots and it also has Germanic roots and then it has these old English roots, right? That's why English is really hard to understand. Spanish and French both have Latin roots. This language never spawned off other languages, this Etruscan language. So thus it's kind of like dead. There's no way to look back through kind of the history and information of the language in order to get an idea of what this says. So no one knows exactly who this person is or exactly what their role in society was, but we know it was an important one because they've obviously been immortalized and also because they're their identity has been preserved. This man's identity, the orator's identity was preserved. All right, last but not least for the Etruscan artworks is the Capitoline Wolf. So we're gonna have a quick little story time here. There's a couple things I wanna point out about this wolf. There's these two young um, children under here who are twins. So this is the myth of how Rome went from being a city-state under the Etruscan Empire or, you know, Etruscan rule into its own powerhouse. So the myth is that these two young, young boys are twins and they are the twin sons of the god Ari, or the god Mars, I'm sorry. So Mars is basically the Roman version of the god of war. Ares is the Greek um, god of war. And they're roughly the same, uh, the same storyline. We'll get more into how the Romans absorbed the Greek gods in a minute. But these are the sons of the god Mars, and they were cast out, right? There was this political thing, that's not important. They were cast out and they were found by this she-wolf who fed them and raised them. Then when they became adults, they then knew that they wanted to found a city. So they had a contest, right? They're the sons of the god of war. So we kind of can assume that they're a little bit hot headed. And they had this contest about how many communications they could have with the sacred realm and basically one saw like a a series of animals and seven crows and then the other one saw a different series of animals and nine crows so they then competed over which symbol 
was the correct one from the gods. And in this conflict, Romulus, right, he slayed his brother Remus. And thus Rome is named after Romulus, right? So he was the winner of the contest between him and his brother, the ultimate victor, and thus the city was named after him. So this Capitan Wolf is part of the storyline where she's found. This, this gives Rome this divine, um, kind of it's founded by these half men, half gods, right? It gives the city this status. That's one of the reasons why this story persisted. And I wanna make a, a, a kind of a clear point just for clarity's sake. These two, this statue of these two boys here, Romulus and Remus was added during the Renaissance. And there is kind of a belief that this sculpture itself, the sculpture of the wolf, was actually made in medieval time. But what's more important than the exact date that this object was made is that this is the storyline of how Rome is founded. So we're gonna hear, when we get to the Baroque period, we're gonna hear another kind of version of the founding of Rome. And they're obviously going to be in a little bit of contrast with each other. But I want you to note that there was always a statue to this wolf from the Etruscan period on. Whether this one was made during the medieval period, the original one may have been made of wood or it may have been demolished in an earthquake or something. There always would be a statue to this wolf she's very important to the mythology of Rome, the mythology of the founding of Rome. So probably gonna be on the test. And look at her, look at her horrible face. She does not look happy and healthy to be caring for these children, right? There's this kind of um, angst about her as they're suckling from her, as they're kind of draining the life force from her. It does not look like it's a very, loving, pleasurable, uh, maternal experience, we'll say. So this brings us to Rome proper, talking about Rome proper. So if you're uh, not familiar with Rome, Rome eventually, right, it has its founding and its kind of beginnings here in uh, that Etruscan city-state, and eventually would come to conquer all of this area. The only other historical figure to ever occupy more area than the Roman Empire was uh, Genghis Khan. All right, so one of the reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, that Rome was so powerful and so incredibly adept, right, if you think about the difference in what it would take to rule people of all the languages that there would be in this area, but what the needs of people would be down here in Egypt, right? So this is roughly where Egypt is and the Nile is, and then all the way up here to England, right? There'd be this incredible difference between the geography, the food sources, all these kinds of things are incredibly vastly different between these two areas. And these people, uh, the Romans ruled, you know, all the way almost to Russia and then, um, into Africa and whatnot. It was this vast area. So what they did was they were really good at absorbing the artistic traditions of their conquered cultures, specifically the um, Greeks. But they did this with everything. They would um, kind of take the best ideas from all of the people that they conquered. If you um, had a really good way in which you created something like bows and arrows or other kind of military equipment. They would take all the craftsmen and bring them back to Rome to teach other people how to do that. So they were incredibly good at absorbing good information from all of the people that surrounded the Mediterranean Sea. So moving on. All right, so like I said, the Roman era overlaps with the Greek era, and the Romans really admired Greek art and copied many of their works. We talked about this with the lost wax bronze casting. A lot of those marble pieces, like specifically that Lacoon and his sons, 
right? That was a remade by the Romans in marble, and then the original was destroyed, right? So there are a, some differences with the artwork that the Romans make and create for themselves. So they have this tradition of recreating Greek artwork from the past and kind of claiming it as their own, I guess. But whenever they make something for the first time for themselves, about themselves, it, it tends to go towards realism and emphasizes the real image of people rather than this idealized proportions of the gods, right? That was really important to the Greeks and it's not so much important to the Romans. All right, so this is encaustic. This is a way of painting, right? So on this note of realistic features and realistic depictions, encaustic is a way of painting with pigment and wax. If you've ever tried to move wax around in any capacity, you can imagine how difficult it would be if you had to paint with wax, which is basically what an encaustic is. It usually happens on wood, but again, there's these realistic features of this boy. This is not the same as those sculptures of the idealized boy, right, that were grave markers for the Greeks. This is trying to hold the depiction, the real image of this child. All right, so here is a great example. So this is a Roman citizen carrying the death masks of his ancestors. So when you pass away in Roman society, if you are important enough, they would put this kind of plaster over your face and then that would harden and they would peel that away and then they could make a positive of your face. Maybe you've done something similar to this in like an art class or something like that. But there's then this real image of you that's preserved. And having a real image of your ancestors reinforces your social status. So basically what this guy is saying is, my great granddaddy and my, my daddy were important and thus I am important, right? There's that lineage that happens. And we'll talk a little bit more about his clothing and the other things that make this guy um, that kind of reinforce his social status. Another thing to point out is this, obviously because this is a one-to-one -one recreation of someone who did pass away, there's an accurate depiction of age. There's an accurate depiction of the facial features, right? People aren't these kind of pristine, idealized um, faces and images that we would have seen in Greek art. People actually have wrinkles and there's kind of that term warts and all comes about during the Roman period. So this brings us to our second frieze, interior frieze that we're gonna look at. And one of the reasons that this freeze was so well preserved is because of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which buried the cities of Pompeii and Herculum. Um, this kind of happened very abruptly. And the nice thing for archaeologists and whatnot was that when the ash settled, excuse me, over these two cities, it like sealed everything kind of exactly as it was. So we get a really good look at kind of like daily life and whatnot that usually doesn't happen in uh, for archaeologists. But what we're looking at here is an interior, what they call the mystery frieze, which is sometimes called the dynastic frieze. So the we talked about the fact or briefly mentioned the fact that the Romans absorbed the religion of the Greeks. They basically took all of the Greek gods and kind of renamed them and retold their stories with maybe slight differences or whatnot. But that was the official religion of the state. Every Roman citizen had to believe and worship the state pantheon of gods. Now, you saw that in huge map of the amount of space that they occupied right? Everyone was supposed to believe in the same thing. Everyone was supposed to worship the Roman gods. 
But what ended up happening was a lot of religions kind of went underground. And that's what they think this fresco depicts. So this fresco is a religious fresco and they believe, remember, this is kind of a theory. This is technically called this kind of mysterious place is this is the god Dionysus, they believe. And he's kind of the, the god of wine and um, fellowship and drink, right? So kind of, kind of party for lack of a better term. And they think that this frieze depicts a procession which would move through the room like this. But there's a lot of mysteries of who all of these characters are and what exactly is going on. So this is not in a church, in a place where the iconography could be read very easily. And also the fact that the iconography that goes along with this would be underground. It would be illegal, basically. And we're gonna talk more about that. But this kind of underground thing is called a cult. And that means something very different than how we use the term cult today. Cult today is kind of used, what the basic term for a cult is, is it's a non, a, a non mainstream religion. So anything that's a smaller religion is a cult, especially when it first starts out. So all of these different cults were essentially illegal at this time. So that point will become more important as we go along. And remember, this is the second freeze, interior freeze that we're seeing for this lecture. This is a detail of that. And again, it's one of the reasons why I put this detail in was to really show there has to be rich iconography going along with this, right? So we have this person here who's pouring this and she has these specific flowers in her hair, right? So does this woman. Right, there's, there's all this information that has to be presented, but we just don't know exactly what it is. And again, this is probably in someone's home and not in a public place. So if you were someone who was wealthy and maybe had this belief structure that was not part of the Roman belief structure, you would do this in the kind of privacy and secrecy of your own home or maybe just you and your friends, that kind of thing. All right, so they, again, believed to be Dionysus. In Rome, he was called Bacchus, god of wine and grape and harvest. All right, so this is from Pompeii. Also, this is another um, portrait of a husband and wife. This is kind of reinforcing that idea of images as social standing. So rather than get a marriage certificate, which is what you kind of get this state thing today when you get married that says like these two people are joined together now. In ancient Rome, you would likely get your portrait painted together. And this wasn't everyone. This was people of significant social status. So if you came from a wealthy family and your so did your spouse or whatever, when you came together, you wanted to make sure you reinforced that bringing together of all the wealth and attributes that went along with marriage. So it's it's partially that, but it's also partially these are real images. This is probably very much what both of these people would have accurately looked like or semi-accurately looked like. All right. So just as clothing is today an indicator of social status, it also was in Roman society. So Roman society is very, very um, stratified. So what do I mean by that? I mean, there's a certain group of people whose whose job and class and social standing is low. Right. So they're farmers and workers and whatnot. There's a military class. There's an elite kind of educated government class. There's a super well, there's a merchant class. There's all these different classes and groups and your clothing is part of what puts you into those groups. So here we see a, a procession of rurals or like an imperial procession. These are royal people. Yeah. I'm having a hard time today, guys. But they all have all this fabric on, which is the toga. 
Right, so the idea behind this is that they're not workers. Their clothing is indicating that they are not workers. They are intellectuals. If you have to hold all of this fabric as you go about your daily life, you don't have time to weed crops or whatever, dig ditches or build roads. You're not doing anything with your hands, right? All of your importance is up here, and that's part of that social standing. Right, or part of what's being communicated by that. So let's break down this artwork with the information that we just got. So I prefer to do this in class because then I can ask students what they see. So there's a couple things that we see that we've already talked about. One is this outstretched arm, which is that orator stance, right? Hey, I have something to say. Next is this fabric thing, which resembles that toga meaning I have stuff to think about and I can't be digging ditches and stuff. Then he's also got this military breastplate on, right? And then he's got this weird, this weird little baby hanging out at his feet. So you're thinking to yourself, there's a lot going on. There's a lot that Augustus of Prima Porta is communicating to us. So let's go to the next slide and break it all down. So in its heyday, this image would have been painted probably very lavishly by our standards today. So let's break down some of these things. This is the ruler. Augustus of Prima Porter is the emperor, right? So you have to listen when he talks, right? He's also got all of this military might. He is the commander of the military and essentially gets credit for all of the military victories that were being accomplished under his rule, right? And that's part of what you see. There's kind of little um, depictions on this breastplate, right? So he's saying, I have the sort of the important speech, I have the important military power, I have this sort of intellectual power via my toga. And then this little baby is called a puti. And the puti is, I don't want to say it's like a cupid, because it's not, but it's basically a little winged messenger that can go between the sacred realm and the realm of the human beings. Right. So if you wanted or if the the gods had a message for you, they would send it via a pute. Right. They're kind of like these little messengers. So Augustus of Prima Porta is saying, I have military power. I have intellectual power. I have divine power and I have something to say. Right. With his outstretched arm like that. So there's a lot of power that he's communicating. And a lot of Roman art is about that. It's about communicating the power that one person has, no matter what that power may be. And we're going to see more examples of that. All right, first, we're going to have a little architectural side note, right? So we the last architectural innovation that we talked about was the corbelled arch, right, which brought kind of weight. It was kind of like these series of stones. I'm not going to like draw all of them. And then it went the weight went down like that. And we talked about that during the Greek period. The Romans create this thing called the arch, which is their iconic, and it distributes a load very similar to how the corbelled arch does. They're basically, the this arch is basically kind of like the evolution of the corbelled arch. And this is what the Romans built everywhere they went. The arch is like the Roman calling card as they built things and constructed things throughout their empire, remember, which was a humongous area. So this is the Pont de Garde. This is in France. So it has that Roman arches. This is a masterful architectural object, right? None of these arches or none of these bricks that this is made out of have any mortar in between them, right? So over time, this has had to be repaired. So there's probably a little bit of mortar in there nowadays. But when it was created, it was just stones set together tightly and properly. It's that much of an architectural um, powerhouse, really. So let's look at exactly what the Pont de Garde is. So there is this area here. So this map 
is kind of the best that I could find to illustrate what's going on here. So there's this river here and there is a natural spring up here that would feed down to that river traditionally. And all the people and all the crops and everything that lived on this side had to walk down to get water and then carry the water back up. This was what was happening before the Romans arrived. So what the Romans did was build this aqueduct, which the water naturally flows down here and then goes across this aqueduct and then comes out on the other side of the river up where the agricultural fields are. So this was a huge improvement for the people who lived in this area, right? It benefited that local community very much so, but it also projected Roman imperial power. It also projected sort of who did this and who was in charge and who improved your life, right? So Romans had to do this to a certain extent. They had to benefit the communities that they essentially took over. Otherwise, people would constantly be revolting against them, which was something that happened. I don't want to get you wrong. But ob objects like this that both benefit people, also we have to take into note that there is a psychological response that's happening. As you're a viewer of this, at the time that Rome would have been in charge, you'd be like, oh, that was built by the people who are in charge of me right, of my people, of my kind of culture, and I have to be quiet about my religion because it's different than theirs, right? I'm just kind of trying to bring you a little bit into the psychology of the time, just a little bit. All right, so this is the Colosseum. Like, again, like I said, the Romans are best known for their architectural and engineering, right? There's that, that classic arch over and over again. Again, the calling card of Rome. So the Colosseum is, it's basically a big sports arena for lack of a better term, we're gonna get into more of what it is here in a moment. But just so you know, see how there's kind of this space and then all this is taken away. During its heyday, during its construction, during the prime time when the Colosseum would have been in use, that would have gone all the way around the building. There would have been three kind of tiers of seating and whatnot going all the way around. But when the Dark Ages hit, a lot of that stone was uh, harvested for other projects and whatnot. At one point in time during the Dark Ages, specifically the Colosseum was actually used as like a big garbage dump. So, but it definitely projected Roman power in its heyday. It was the ultimate place of entertainment and pleasure. So like I said, this place would have seated all of these people, right? So Roman dignitaries, everyone who's important, regular, regular people, you know, to a small extent, there would have been these giant canvas things that would have come out over to shade it. And then here would have been in the center area would have been where gladiators would have fought. They would have brought exotic animals from all over the kingdom into this area to fight each other and to fight gladiators and all these other kinds of things. But they also, this is what I find incredibly amazing, is that they actually filled this with water and had little mock naval battles on it. Now I say little mock naval battles, like I'm holding my hands, but they would have been these giant reconstru smaller reconstructions of larger ships, right? If you can imagine how much engineering would need to go into flooding something of this size so that you could have a, a battle on it and then taking that water away so that at a later date you could have people and animals run around and fight each other on the same area, the same kind of platform. That is super incredible amount of engineering. So enough with that. You're gonna need to know the Colosseum, which you may have already been familiar with before this class, but you're gonna need to know, at least be able to identify it on the test. All right, next we're talking about equestrian portrait. And we're kind of going back to that idea of Roman 
power being projected and who is in charge being projected. And it's about the civic leaders and the emperors. Um, the Colosseum, even though it's like a building for entertainment, it still projects Roman power and projects this, this is the place where there is entertainment, right? And it owns all of these various places and is able to bring all of these animals and whatnot, and it's for its own people, right? It's projecting that civic power. So here we have the equestrian portrait, right? So there's a couple similar things. Anytime there is sort of a military leader on horseback, he's always going to be kind of slightly higher than you, right? Meaning that he's a commander. So Marcus Aurelius here, he has his kind of Roman toga type thing on, but yet he's on horseback. So he's communicating that military power. He's also communicating that kind of toga power, right? Which is basically like civic power or um, some sort of authority of the government, right? And then he's got an outstretched hand. I know it might not be that easy for you to see because it's kind of on the other side of his body, right? Meaning that he's got something to say. But let's look at this object in its true context. Right, look how high he is, right? You, as the viewer, are never able to look this statue in the eye. You are always looking up at it. And then on top of that, it has this outstretched hand over top of you. And anytime, like if you've ever, if you have a dog and you kind of need your dog to like settle down or something like that, you know, you put your hand on their head and that will sometimes kind of like you're, it's like a dominating thing. Like you're in charge and they're beneath you, right? So there's this pseudo animal-ish gesture of this hand over top of all of the people beneath, which makes sense as a civic leader, right? But there's also this projection of power that's coming out of this object. And I feel like I'm kind of harping on this topic, but this is really what Roman art is all about, is this projection of Roman power. Because Rome has this incredible area of the world that it occupies, it has to use its art. It has to use it's, um, what do I want to say, it's architecture and it's innovations. It has to use all of these things in order to maintain that power. It's not just a military power that it has to maintain. All right, that brings us to the Arch of Titus. All right, so there are going to be two arches that you're going to see in this class. This is the first one. It's also the first chronologically, All right? So at the time, let's get a different at the time that this would have been here, this would have been like an entrance to the city. So there would be walls on either side here. And if you were entering the city of Rome or sort of like Roman territory, well, everything was Roman territory, but if you were entering the city proper, there would be guards posted here and you'd have to, to go through and it would, you know, it'd be like a checkpoint for lack of a better term. And then when you went through this arch, which is obviously the arch is that calling card of um, Rome, on the inside, there are these kind of like relief freeze type things here, which depict um, Titus's domination of the Jews and the Temple of Solomon, right? So we see that iconography here right with the menorah and then we'll look at the sculpture on the other side right and then here we see sort of the the romans so this is titus here right as he commands all of these horses and all of these forces and he's kind of got his little toga thing on there and he's got this kind of angel behind him which i believe is probably a depiction of like the goddess of war or something like that. So there is this clear, so just to put you, again, to put you in the mindset, you are going into this city that of people that rule you, that are your commanders, right? They are the government that has taken over your government. They tell you what to believe in. They tell you all this stuff. And as you enter, you're sort of faced with this, these are other people that 
tried to stand up against the power of Rome and Rome has overtaken them, right? And it's a little bit to keep you in your place. It's projecting that Roman power, keeping you in your place as a citizen. So next we're moving on to the Pantheon, which probably looks familiar and you might be thinking we see this already, but we didn't. So my first question, if we were in class together, I'd be like, what capital orders are these? Remember them from the Greek lecture? And you'd all say Corinthian. And then we'd all be like, yay, because we'd be seeing each other in person. All right, moving on. So this is just for a refresher. This is that cornice, that area here in Greek architecture. It would always be covered in like relief sculptures. And then this is the frieze, which here just has text on it. And again, in uh, Greek architecture would have those meadows and other things on there. So this is clearly drawing from that Greek tradition. Remember, the Romans saw themselves as the inheritors of the Greeks, of all the Greek culture. All right, so there we can kind of see the difference between the two of them. But the Pantheon is very different than the Parthenon in architecture. In the purpose that it serves, which is a house to all of the gods or a temple to all of the gods, they are the same, right? They are both temples to the whole pantheon of gods rather than um, like one god individually. So, or one deity, however you want to say it, one sacred realm character individually. So they are different in architecture, pretty much the same in purpose. But the So this section in the back is what I want to draw your attention to here, this round section. So we're going to look at the next slide. So this is a domed rotunda, right? Basically, what this building kind of is, is it's kind of like this Greek face, right? This whole area here, right? The portico, the, the columns, the capitals, the freeze all of that is very derived from the greeks but then behind it the rest of the building is very very roman in its architecture and a lot of kind of just the way it communicates things so let's look in inside of the building at its um kind of core architecture so in this rotunda in this round area there's actually an oculus which is a uh, it's a hole in the ceiling to let light in, basically. It is still there today. It's not covered in glass or anything like that. If it rains and water does come in, the floor is ever so gradually sloped so that water wicks away very, very quickly. There isn't water that's kind of like kept in there. Remember, these are master engineers. And we see that also with this dome. So there's two kind of vocabulary words that are coming at you simultaneously. One is oculus, right? And the other is coffered dome. So let's go to the next slide to talk about what coffered means. So this is like a cross section of the building if we took the building and sliced it in half. Um, so you can see how thick the cement is here right and they had to get it thinner if they had left it that thick it would obviously collapse in on itself they needed to make sure it had structure but also not have so much weight so each of these little squares that you see is actually this dug out section if you can kind of follow that line and that decreases the weight right and then these ribs these sections in between the coffering create structure and support. So if you're thinking to yourself, what, why do we need to know this for art history? Just trust me that it's all going, it's all gonna come together. Just trust me, guys. All right, so that is coffered. We're gonna see this term again, that's gonna come back. So coffered dome with an oculus. All right, next place we're going is we're gonna talk about the catacombs. So 
Catacombs are places where people are laid to rest. Right? So this is a series of underground tunnels and then each of these kind of little places would be a place where someone would be laid to rest and their their body could return to the earth for lack of a better term. So this practice of interring people in these tombs is important for the pagan religion of Rome, the official religion of Rome, but also for Jewish people and Christians. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Earlier in this lecture, I introduced that idea of um, cults or underground religions that didn't practice the mainstream religion. All right. So imagery can be interpreted by different groups differently. Right. So if you were to show a here, we kind of have on the side here, we have a good example, which is we kind of have these like winged creatures. Right. And in Christianity, this winged creature is like an angel. Right. But as we saw in the Greek tradition, that's a depiction of the goddess Nike. Right. So when things are look similar, but interpreted in different ways, this allows for some potential kind of underlaying of the true faith of the person, right? All of the people that were interned here during this time frame had to, they had to worship that state religion. Like I said, they had to worship the religion of Rome. So that's why we see sort of this Medusa up here, but maybe they were trying to secretly communicate their belief structures through iconography in these images these might be angels, right? So this makes it really difficult for art historians and for other people who are, you know, religious historians, all kinds of people who are looking back at the artwork in these tombs from this time frame to really know exactly what the belief was of the people who were there, of the people who were laid to rest in these catacombs. Right? Sometimes storylines can, um, be are a little bit more apparent than others. So here we have this image of Samson from the Old Testament, which would be uh, a Jewish depiction here. And it's a little bit more loud and proud because eventually it wasn't so much that this, in the very, at one point in time in Rome, this was a humongous deal. And then eventually over time, it was not as big of a deal, which we will talk about more here in just a second. Um, so here we have, again, these kind of figures with these praying hands. And then we have this kind of shepherd with something around his neck, which they have identified as a shepherd. But it could have been a image of a person with a lamb and that could be associated with the Roman religion. So again, there's just kind of this mix of exactly who and what these people would have believed in because you had to put certain images in there so that way others didn't know that you were a Christian or a Jew or any of the other believed in ancient Egyptian religion, whatever the case may have been of your um, religious beliefs that had to be kept very under wraps at this time. And then everything changed. So like I said, it eventually it didn't, it wasn't as important. And that's because of this guy who's Constantine. So I told you that you were going to see two arches in this lecture, right? So this is the same kind of thing. This is on the south side of the city and there would have been walls that would have come out of here. And if you had to enter and then you had to exit you kind of had to show your credentials there would have been soldiers stationed here all right but what's on the interior of this arch is a little bit different than the previous one so this is the remnants of the great statue of constantine and constantine is the first christian emperor of rome and when he takes power he takes power at a very turbulent time where rome actually splits from one unified um empire into two and then we'll talk more about that in the next lecture this one's getting a little long 
All right, so these are all of the key terms we will pick up with early Christian and Byzantine art with Constantine. All right, so he is the next thing that we will talk about in the next lecture. So if you have any questions on anything, please uh, shoot me an email. Everybody stay happy and healthy. Thank you.